This week on Intrigued Full Effect. It's just been a, a huge hole in my life. Um, I mean, Joseph and I were really close. So I was just looking forward to the future with that, with each other. Like I, you know, I'm expecting and I would have loved for him to be around. I know he would have been an amazing uncle. I'm Shondrea Thomas and welcome to episode 36. In this podcast, I talk about curious cases, disappearances and other stuff. And today I'm talking about the curious case and death of 20 year old Joseph Smedley from Bloomington, Indiana. The University of Indiana biochemistry major vanished on September 28th of 2015 after leaving his apartment. According to Joseph's sister, he was sharing that apartment with his Sigma Pi fraternity brothers at the time of his disappearance. Joseph's body was found at Lake Griffey near the UI campus five days later. And how he was found is even more disturbing. There was a backpack filled with over 60 pounds of rocks strapped to his chest and a pair of binoculars around his neck. Now, there's a lot of mystery and speculation about how Joseph got into the water, the events of the night he was last seen, and what happened afterwards. We'll get deep into all of that. I spoke to Joseph's sister, Vivian, and I reached out to the Bloomington Police Department and the Sigma Pi fraternity about the case. This is what happened. So your brother was last seen on September 27th of 2015, right? So tell me what happened that leading up to that day and everything that kind of followed after that. Okay. Um, so my brother was staying in um, a campus apartment and he decided that he wanted to um, move out and move in to a um, rental home with two of his fraternity brothers that are part of Sigma Pi. He had spoken to the apartments and I guess they had, from his understanding, they told him that they would just find a replacement for him. That wasn't the case. And I actually was the guarantor, which it, um, I found out later is the co-signer for that apartment. So the apartments had reached out to me and said um, that they were, uh, that Joseph had vacated the apartment and that he still owed money. I think it was, I mean, it wasn't a ton of money, but um, I think it was like $600 or something like that, that he would need to pay. And so they said, if he didn't pay it, that I would be responsible for it. So um, I called Joseph about a week before he disappeared and, uh, you know, said, hey, like, what's going on with this? And he was confused because I guess he didn't read the contract and he misunderstood what they had said about him leaving the apartment. So he said he had been working all summer and there's a ton of checks that he hadn't picked up yet. And so he was going to get on that as soon as he could. Um, that following Monday at noon, he was supposed to turn in the check. That was the deadline. So I pretty much followed up with him every day, just checking in to make sure that he was going to have it. And, um, you know, he never changed from that. He said he would have it. And then that Sunday night, um, around like seven or eight, I called him and said, you know, hey, are you still good to go for tomorrow at noon? And he said, yeah, I got to check on my desk. I'm studying and um, I'll be able to drop it off tomorrow. And I said, great. So then I woke up the next morning and I had a text from him at like four or 430 in the morning. And it said something along the lines of like, Viv, I'm sorry, I'm leaving the country. Um, I can't tell you why. Don't attempt to contact me. I'll contact you once I'm set up overseas. And so I was kind of like, what? That isn't that, like, I thought he was joking. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, all right, well, you know, shut up. I think I said, and I was like, make sure you have that check. And um, so then I tried to get call him and his phone was going straight to voicemail. And I'm thinking like, this is a really weird time for him to be playing a joke. Mm -hmm. um, so then I waited till about noon. I'm like, all right, if I haven't heard from, like, I have, if I haven't heard from him by noon, I'm going to call the um, campus apartments. So I called them and they said they hadn't seen him. And so I thought that that was really strange because I just talked to him the night before. He said he had it handled. And uh, so then I um, tried to call him again and he didn't answer. Still going straight to voicemail. So I decided, okay, well, you know, if he's going to play this game with me, then I'm going to take it seriously. And I'm going to call the campus police and say that he's missing. And at the time, I thought I was just being more dramatic than anything, that they were going to like show up to his class and embarrass him. So I called campus police and I just said, hey, 
um, my brother, I think something, he sent me a weird text and um, I don't know what um, it all means. And, you know, I'm just, I'm worried for him. Can you do a wellness check? So they went to his class to see if he was there and he wasn't. And so I was starting to kind of be concerned at that point. Um, they said that they were gonna keep looking for him. Um, then at one point they had said they had found him and that he was in jail. Hmm. So um, I just thought that was weird because he's not really the kind of kid that gets in trouble very much. Um, they said that he was in jail for battery. And I was like, that doesn't sound like him unless he's like defending someone. Like that would be the only reason why I would think that. Um, so I called the jail and then they said that he wasn't there. And I'm like, okay, well, the IU police department says that he is there. And they're like, well, we don't have anyone there by that name. So we went back and forth for a while. I had other people call the jail to ask for him. They said the same thing. And I finally was able to get in touch with um, the uh, IE police department again and say, hey, listen, call them one more time. They're saying that he's not there um, and see if you get a different answer this time. Because I just kept saying like, we're not gonna call back. We already got the answer. So they finally agreed to call. And when they did, um, they found out that it was the wrong person. It was a John Smedley, not a Joseph Smedley. Wow. So so this sounds like it was kind of messy from the very beginning. When do you discover that he's really missing, missing? You know what I mean? Yeah. So right after they had found out that wasn't him and he's not in jail, they immediately said, we're going to make him a missing person tonight. So they filed him as a missing person. Um, the very next day, I went up to Bloomington, started canvassing the campus and asking questions. That happened on Monday. And then Tuesday is when they were looking for him on campus. So they started looking at, like, seeing if he's going to any of his classes. They went to the house that he was with his two roommates and fraternity brothers. And all of a sudden, they produced this note out of nowhere. And they said, oh, yeah, by the way, you know, we've got this note, handwritten note. Uh, it basically says, I'm leaving the country. Don't attempt to contact me. Um, and it's signed Smedley, which is really weird because he never went by that name. Mm -hmm. The only people that called him that were his fraternity brothers. Does he write like that? Does it sound like him? Yeah, so it's basically identical to the text message. There was a little bit more fluff in the text message of saying, like, I love you, Viv, and um, you know I, I'm not I'm not telling you why I'm leaving because uh, it's for uh, it's for your own protection or something like that. But the whole like I'm leaving the country, don't attempt to contact me. That was the same. So that didn't really sound like him. First of all, like I just talked to him the night before, and he's not the kind of person that would run away from his problems. Like we've talked but before and he knew that how important it was for him to turn in that check because he knew it was going to impact my credit and I was looking for a house at the time um so if for some reason like he couldn't put pull it together he would have just told me and we would have found other options um so it's not a like him to run away from his problems or something like that also like he didn't have a passport um and like it just it was just really strange. It just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, there's no way that he's leaving the country. And I know that also that he doesn't have a ton of money. So, you know, where would he have had the money to flee that fast within a 12 hour hmm. time frame of I'm going to drop a check off in the morning and I'm leaving the country at 4 a.m. That's something I've, I've never heard, though that he didn't even have a passport. So that makes the note and the text message sound, seem shady altogether. You know what I'm right. saying? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so this time, time goes on. So you guys, are, I'm, I'm assuming you guys are canvassing the campus, the, the community, the neighborhood, and then ultimately, so he goes missing on this Sunday. That's when he was last seen. Tell me about when he was last seen. And he was something about the blood moon. Let's talk about that too. So he was supposed to be checking that out. Yeah, so... But Tuesday, I asked his roommates what was going on, and they all said, the two roommates said that they didn't leave the house. They stayed at home and watched a movie and then went to bed around 11. From what I heard from other fraternity brothers is that they had lunch that day, which was aligned with his bank statements. They went to Noodles and Company 
And then they, one of his fraternities had talked about going to see the blood moon. And Joseph was later found with binoculars around his neck. So I think that's consistent with the fact that they could have been out there watching the blood moon together. But the, the timeline for the blood moon does not, it goes over the 11 o'clock time frame that his roommate said they went to bed. So he also, the de detective had told me that he was reaching out to a bunch of different girls and asking them to come and hang out and look at the blood moon with him that day. Cause it was like a blood moon and an eclipse at the same time. So it was a really rare moment and he's a science-based guy. So he just, like, that was something that he was like, you know, really excited about. Yeah, that's basically what he was doing that night. And I know that he was with at least six or seven fraternity brothers because one of the guys I talked to actually listed all the people that he was with that night. So his one, one of the other person is lying that he was either sitting at home watching a movie and then going to bed at 11 or he's with his fraternity brothers all night doing God knows what. So let's get to the point where you find out, you know, what, five days later. So he, he disappears on Sunday then he's found like at the end of the week. So tell me what happened and what do you think about where he was found and how he was found? Cause it's also bizarre to me. Yeah. So um, I just happened to be up there. It was Friday that he was found. Um, we were actually eating at a restaurant like right on like in the middle of uh, the town area basically we met up where the last cell phone ping was which was a seventh and walnut and so uh that was like became our meeting spot there's like a taco bell and it's kind of like a bunch of bars and stuff down there and we were eating dinner and just getting ready to leave and all of a sudden you see like a bunch of police cars just go go down the, that main street. And, so, and that made me feel uneasy. I'm like, okay, that's a lot of cop cars. There's probably like 10 or 11 of them. And so we were just kind of fit, trying to figure out like, you know, what's going on. Um, I, I called the detective and she said, well, there's been a body that's been found in the lake. We don't know any information about it. So you, should, you can just go home. So we sat there for a little bit we tried to go down to the lake and it was like closed off about a mile back. And actually the detective was standing at the road by a lock and she's like, just, you know, don't worry about it. Like we won't have any information tonight. You know, I'm like, what? you know, I don't live here. I live about an hour away. So she's like, we'll just go home. We met back up at the spot and we were kind of just sitting there for a little bit. And then we started to get phone calls about like, Hey, do you have any dinner records? Do you know if he's ever been fingerprinted? And all this stuff, they started asking questions. Um, and the people that I was with, I had a IMPD detective and um, who's just a friend of mine and a prosecutor as well. So they just kind of came to help. And so she was kind of giving me like tips and saying, you know, trying to guide me through the situation. She's like, if they're asking those questions, then most likely they, they have a hunch that it's your brother. And so we sat up there a little bit longer. And just as we were starting to leave, I get a phone call saying, you know, hey, um, we have some more questions for you. Can you come to the precinct? I, I said yes. And I went to the precinct. Still at that time, they, I didn't know it was my brother. When I got there, one of his roommates was already sitting outside the precinct. Um, so I thought that that was really strange because they hadn't even said anything to the family yet. And I know that they sent out like a news, uh, like a very general report that just said a body was found in Griffey Lake. So it was just interesting that he was already there and waiting. We got inside and then that's when they said that they had identified him as my brother. And then they, I, they said that he had a backpack on, um, like a light jacket, sweatpants and shoes. And I asked them, you know, what, what was in the backpack? And they said at the time that it was just a hard drive, kind of like a laptop charger and some school paperwork. Then later I found out once the coroner report came out that there was 66 pounds of, walk, of rocks in his backpack as well. And it was strapped to his chest. Now see that right there, that right there, the biggest detail of all is left out of what they tell you initially, which is kind of just crazy. Let me ask you this question because I think there are some things that we need to clarify and clear up about your brother. Um, so let's just get into that. The first thing is, do you, did you ever know for your brother to be suicidal? Had he ever threatened suicide before in the past? No, his, that's not his personality. And I know that, you know, people say all the time, there's happy people that 
you know, do commit suicide and it's unexpected. I understand that. But Joseph and I had a really good relationship. We talked all the time. I know that the fraternity was stressful and I know he's been through a lot of stressful things in his life, but I also think that's what makes him a lot stronger. He's always been a really determined person. He's always wanted to be very successful. He didn't have a good relationship with our parents. So like, I know that part of him wanted to prove them wrong and just be as successful as possible. He had huge goals. So I don't think that that shows signs of someone who's suicidal on top of the fact that the detective was telling me about the text messages that he was sending that night, that day that he had disappeared. A lot of it was to girls kind of getting them to come to a party that was that Thursday, the following Thursday. So it's just like, if someone decides to commit suicide, and obviously it had to be planned if you're going to walk 45 minutes to a lake and jump in the water with a backpack full of rocks, then they're not planning events. They're not, you know, making plans for the future or for, for the following week if they're in that headspace. And another thing that you mentioned to me when we, when we were talking before was also that your, your brother is pretty, pretty intelligent. So to, to kill yourself in that way seems very, um, like one of the worst ways you can, you can do it. You know what I'm right. saying? So, so what, what would you say to that? Yeah, I, he's a pre-pharmaceutical major in biochemistry. So obviously like he's extremely intelligent. He always has been since he was a kid. We used to joke and call him little boy genius. I know that if he were to go that route, that's not the first thing he would have found like some kind of chemical or, you know, like some, some kind of medication that he could take to do that. He wouldn't, he didn't have a car. So he would have had to walk 45 minutes. It would have been pitch black. The only road leading down to Griffey Lake does not have any lights. So he would have to walk down that road without being able to see his, his hand in front of his face, go down to the lake, find enough rocks, which I've been down there and tried to find 66 pounds of rocks. And that's even difficult But find that many rocks, put it in your backpack in the dark and then jump off a bridge hmm. and drown yourself. That is just, it doesn't make sense. Do you have any theories about what you think happened to your brother that night? Just as I piece things together, I feel like he, he was excited about the blood moon. He wanted to make a big deal out of it. You know, they decided to go to the lake because they thought that'd be the best view and something went wrong down there. Obviously he had his binoculars with him. So he was prepared to be watching something. And at night, really the moon's the only thing you can see with binoculars. So I think, you know, that he had tried to reach out to some of his other friends to see if they wanted to join him. And they said no. And then he ended up with just the fraternity brothers. And they probably were drinking, having a good time out there and something went wrong. Another thing that you mentioned to me was your brother's height, right? How tall he was and like the, the feet of the water where he, of where he was found. Can you tell me about that? And explain that to me really quick. Yeah, so it was about 5'10". I believe at the time that he was found, the water was only about three feet deep. I just went back there last, probably like June or July with the Cold Case Chronicles podcast group. And they were doing a lot of measurements and the, they found that the uh, water under the bridge at that time was five feet. He's five ten. Hmm. Drowning in five feet of water when you're five foot ten. And he was a good swimmer. We've both been swimming since we could walk. And just to clarify some things about your brother as well, because I know like we were like I was saying before, people are analyzing bits and pieces of whatever they can find about him on the internet. Did your brother have a criminal history? Was there someone who may have been after your brother? Was there anything like that in his life that you can think of that would create a scenario where someone would do that to him? I don't think so. He didn't have a criminal past. I think he had been stopped one time for marijuana, but it never got into like any charges or anything like that. Could there be some enemy out there that I don't know about? Sure. But it still just doesn't explain how he got down to the lake by himself and with binoculars around his neck. What went through your mind when you realized that your brother was gone, that they had found his body? I, I honestly don't even know. I was just shocked. I didn't for a million years think that it would be my brother. 
Um, I just remember being like, even all the way up to that Friday that, oh, he's off on some trip with the boys and he's in a cabin or something and he doesn't have cell service. Like I just, I had all these different excuses or trying to figure out other scenarios. But I'm just like, there's just no way that if he could be gone. Mm-hmm. So once I found, figured, found that out, it still felt surreal. I just, I, and it took me a while to even accept that he could actually not be here anymore. Like it just, I just couldn't believe it. I know that the fraternity brothers have been to that lake frequently. There's um, information in text messages that say back in like August, they uh, were taking pledges down there. Now, as far as your family and you guys kind of conducting your own investigation, because I'm guessing that you're not satisfied with the investigation from the police department. Tell me about how you feel about that and the things that you guys have done on your own. We tried to kind of communicate with Bloomington Police Department. Basically, I I reported Joseph missing. I pretty much did all of that. And when his body was found, it was actually, it was technically Monroe County's property, even though it was on IU's campus. So all the jurisdictions changed and the the person that I communicated with changed. And once those changed over, um, Bloomington Police Department then picked up the case from IU Police Department. And then they just kind of shut me out. They ended up reaching out to Joseph's father, who hasn't been in the picture for five plus years, and decided to work with him instead. So it kind of became this different dynamic where it was Joseph's father and his wife, and they were working with Bloomington Police Department and then kind of just keeping me in the loop. So I would send them information, send them questions for them to ask, and they were meeting with Bloomington Police Department without me. They had one big meeting with them where they had, I guess the uh, chief of police had recommended that they cremate Joseph's body. And so my father decided that he was going to do that, why he would listen to them and do that. Um, I did get to perform a second autopsy um, with Dr. Uh, Thomas Sozio, a forensic pathologist that's removed from IU before they were they, they cremated him. But yeah, so they decided to cremate him. They also tried to get a handwriting analysis done. So I provided the um, handwriting for that. The police department came back and said they needed more and I sent more. And then we never heard anything from them. That was about the extent of their investigation. After that, they really just stopped communicating with the family. I was really unsatisfied, especially because I wasn't able to be as involved as I should have been. I should have been directly involved. And I know it's more of a family issue. Um, I I think that they just kind of wanted to take the reins. And I guess I understand. But so because of that, there were a lot of questions and things that I feel got missed. And they were just kind of willing to walk away with what the police department had done. And I wanted to continue to fight and figure out Mm-hmm. what happened. Yeah, because you, you have questions. So on your own as well, so you had the second autopsy done on your own. So you do have those records, or you have that information. Um, you are doing your own um, handwriting analysis as well, and you're trying to get his possessions back. Is that pretty much accurate? Yes. Yeah, I have a power of attorney for my mother um, to act in her standing, because uh, she actually wasn't a part of the investigation that my father and his uh, wife at the time were um, doing. So she gave me power of attorney and I had tried to go and get his possessions and they were um, they were not releasing them to me, even with that documentation. I also, with the forensic pathologist, once I had the second autopsy performed, he tried to reach out to Bloomington Police Department to get the notes um, so that he could draw his own conclusions with the report, it's actually not finished because they would not cooperate, which is unlike a police department. I know that because my friend who is an IMPD detective basically um, told me that in a normal situation, when a family has discrepancies between the coroner's autopsy and their independent autopsy, you're supposed to meet with 
all of them sit down and come to a different conclusion or figure out where the inconsistencies are so that you can make a better judgment on what happened. And they were completely unwilling to share any information, even though the, doc, the forensic pathologist has said, it's not being passed on to the family. I'm just using it so I can complete my report. He had tried to call, send emails, and he was not able to do that. So I've been waiting five plus years to try to get that information so that we could finish the autopsy report. So I reached out to the Bloomington Police Department for a statement in response to the case, and I received the following statement. This is what it says. In the state of Indiana, cause and manner of death are determined by the coroner of the county in which the death occurred. At the time of Mr. Smedley's death, all available information was fully investigated. This included several interviews with family members and acquaintances of Mr. Smedley. The Monroe County coroner, in conjunction with investigators from the Bloomington Police Department, determined that Mr. Smedley's death was a suicide by drowning. Since the conclusion of the investigation, BPD has not been made aware of any new facts or information related to the case, and the Monroe County coroner has not asked for any further assistance from law enforcement. I also reached out to Sigma Pond for a statement and I never heard back. And that's kind of where I am now, which is trying to subpoena the documents from Bloomington Police Department. I also hired a, a private investigator and then my, that PI found um, someone to do the handwriting analysis and that's who I just hired and we're waiting for the results. So you have the handwriting and then I, I do remember seeing something about like his body supposedly having some sort of bruising, not consistent with the drowning. So mm -hmm. what exactly is that? Can you clarify that? Yeah. So the, my independent autopsy, the forensic pathologist, he found that they had completely mishandled his body in general. They put his clothes in with him in the body bag instead of putting it in evidence. So there was a lot of things that were missed. It didn't seem like his fingernails were even scraped or anything. They also didn't examine his back, which he thought was strange because usually you do the front and the back. So when he examined his back, he found hemorrhaging, which he, could, he said could be consistent with someone pushing on him or him falling on his back. Tell me about your brother. Now, how, do you know how he ended up in this fraternity or, or why he decided to join this particular fraternity? I really don't know what what was going through his mind. I know the kind of person he is. He wants to be accepted. And when he told me he was pledging the year before, I tried to talk him out of it because I said, I just, I'm not a fan of fraternities or sororities. And I just knew that I just had a bad feeling. I was just like, this is not, why, why are you doing this? And I remember he was always tired. He always needed money from me because they were constantly making him do things and pay and take and be the the driver and pay for their meals and pay for all this stuff and like basically hazing him for a whole semester. And so he was always exhausted. And I just kept asking like, why are you doing this? And he just said, you know, well, it's all going to be worth it. In the end, you know, I'm, I'm going to have connections and like, and that's that, that's that part where I, you know, it proves the determination in him because he was willing to put himself through that just to have connections so that he could continue to be successful in the future. And even though I didn't agree with it, you know, the fact that he would fight that hard to get into this fraternity just shows his determination. But also I just, I just wish he would have never joined it. I also realized too, that like a lot of his friends that he started having in um, his freshman year were all gone by his sophomore year once he was in the fraternity. So like most fraternities only hang out with their brothers. So that when he went missing, it was very hard for me to find out like who he was with or he, who to even contact to start and say, have you seen Joseph? Because all his old friends that I knew were, hadn't talked to him since he joined the fraternity in about a year. So what would you say to, to other families who, you know, who are, who are in your shoes, who want answers, who want, who want to know what's happened with their loved ones, you know, what would you say to them? Like, do you have any words of wisdom for people? Yeah, I'd say, you know, it's a long road. It's not like on TV where you think things are just going to get solved. And honestly, like the justice system is really broken. It's a hard fight because they're, it's like a boys club. 
and they don't really care about you or your family members. So you have to do things that are going to cover your own bases and you've got to do your own investigating. You've got to keep all that information up as, as long as you can and get as much as you can up front as possible because, you know, as time goes on, it's harder and harder to um, stay organized. And I think that that's one of the big things that helped me is that I've been extremely organized from day one. I, you know, I record, I've recorded conversations. I keep screenshots and all that stuff has helped me now in the future. So if, if a family is up for the fight, then they just got to do things. They can't, don't rely on the police department. Let's talk about justice for Joseph and the petition that you have. How did that all come about? And where are you with that right now? Because I know you got like a lot of signatures on that. Yeah. So um, Justice for Joseph came out. I started that page a little bit after the uh, first or after the coroner's report came out and Bloomington Police Department was kind of shutting us out. I had a lot of people reaching out to me and asking how they could help. And so I just thought it would be a good idea to have some kind of page or information that people could go to to see kind of what th- what had been transpiring and what we're doing and all of that. And it kind of just blew up from there. And then actually just this past uh, spring, spring of 2020, um, when the George Floyd situation was happening, things started picking back up. And uh, there was a ton of momentum. My friend had reached out to me and, or actually it was just, it was actually someone that just followed Joseph's page they reached out and said, hey, can I, do you mind if I start a petition for him? And I said, absolutely. Um, and so uh, he had started the position, petition, sent it to me. I put it up on the page and then it just kind of blew up overnight. And I think we have about 115,000 signatures now. So yeah, we've just, we've had a huge momentum in 2020 with people just, just at that point, finding out about the case. And a lot of different like podcast groups and things that uh, reach out to me that I've been working with. You know, you're very fortunate too, because a lot of people don't have access to like a prosecutor and detective to help give you guidance and kind of help you along with this process. You're, so, I mean, you're really lucky in, in that aspect of all of this. I'm assuming mm-hmm. that's been super helpful with just kind of knowing what to ask and, and kind of digging into information. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And along with the petition, I also raised $10,000 last year as well. And that's what, that's how, what I was able to use to um, get my private investigator and attorney. So, so, so what is your private investigator saying at this point without telling everything, but I'm just kind of curious about what, what kind of what they're coming up with. Honestly, it's been a little slow, a little bit slower than I expected. I think that still we need to subpoena the documents from Bloomington police department before we're able to do really all the things that they can do. Again, it's kind of the same position of the forensic pathologist where it's, you know, we don't have access to the interviews. We don't know, you know, how he was found, you know, all these different things, like the position of his body, the temperature of the water, like all that stuff is important in order to move forward. And so that's why, like, I'm still kind of on the hunt for a good attorney. I thought I had one. She wasn't able to kind of provide me with what I would need it. So yeah, it's, it's, I definitely am. I definitely think that they're going to be useful, but just right now it's just, we're still a little bit at a standstill because of Bloomington police department unwilling to cooperate, which is just really sad because, you know, they say the case is closed and if they don't want to spend their resources on that. Okay. The family is saying that they're willing to pick up where they left off. And all we need is the documentation to do so. If they're so, if they're so adamant that it's a suicide, what is the, what's the problem? Why is that such a big issue that we can no longer use our own resources to continue the case ourselves? I just don't understand that, but we're just going to, I'm just going to keep figuring out a way to get what we need so that we can continue to push forward. Tell me about the interaction with the fraternity since your brother's death. Have you heard from them? The funeral? What, what's happened with since then? So I haven't heard a thing from them. Um, I was in contact with Joseph's roommates for a little bit while he was missing. Once he was found, things just kind of got weird. IU did a joint 
vigil. That same week, there was a double homicide that had happened on campus as well. So the Trinity Brothers did go to that, which was probably a couple of days after Joseph was found. But after that, we hadn't seen or heard anything from him. I put on a memorial service at our high school and only one fraternity brother showed up out of who knows how many, like 50 guys. So that was really strange. And then one of his roommates left the campus and actually didn't come back for the rest of the semester, which was also strange. And now they have all lawyered up. So it's really hard to get in touch with them or even ask questions. When I look at your your Facebook page, it's very thorough. I'm so grateful to everybody. I mean, honestly, this wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't for all the people who have shared, donated, um, and just took an interest in Joseph's case, attended events that we've had. I mean, it's just the fact that there's one thing that, you know, I can believe in, you know, what what I can believe in the fact that Joseph didn't commit suicide, but Joseph made such an impact on so many people through high school and college that, you know, a ton of people knew who he was as a person and how amazing he was. Everyone said that he was full of life. Um, and the fact that people can follow this story and also, and there's so many people that can see where the inconsistencies are and how bizarre and unlikely this is all to be a suicide is just really big. I mean, it, it honestly just proves that there is more there. And the fact that people are, that are interested in that has been so helpful in continuing to get his case out there. Did you guys get like the toxicology and all that stuff? Like what did, what did you guys learn from that? So it said that he had THC and Benadryl in his system. Hmm. Um, and I think alcohol as well. Um, but that was it. Uh, also the toxicology, according to my forensic pathologist, it was really hard for, because of the fact that he was in the water for five days, it's difficult to know the actual levels of his toxicology, because he said that as your body decomposes, there are certain levels that are askew because your body naturally produces THC and alcohol. And at the time that his body was found, he didn't have blood left in his body. It would have just been like fluid. The, but the fact that Benadryl was in his system is kind of strange. I didn't know him to be, have allergies. At the end of the day, what do you want to see happen out of all of this? So honestly, I just want his name, the suicide to be removed from his death certificate. I think it's a slap in the face to who he was as a person. Um, I just don't think that he deserves to have that next to his name. He would not give up that easily. And at the very least, like, you know, if they want to call it inconclusive or something like that, you know, that at least leaves the door open to figuring things out. But the fact that they're calling it a suicide just because he had rocks in his backpack is just not a strong enough case for me. And so I just, I'd like them to change that. If you had an opportunity, you know, to say something to your brother, what, what do you think that would be? Man, I don't know. (laughs) I guess I would just tell him that, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep fighting for him because he deserves it. And I know that he didn't commit suicide and I want, I'm going to, I'm going to figure things out. I'm going to find out what happened. Tell me about the impact that this is having on your family. How is this affecting you, your family, you know, all of this? Because this is so, it's all so strange. For me, it's, it's just been a a huge hole in my life. Joseph and I were really close. So I was just looking forward to the future with that, with each other. Like I, you know, I'm expecting, and I would have loved for him to be around. I know he would have been an amazing uncle. Like he's so good with kids and you know, I just, you know, he's missed out on everything. He has, he hasn't gotten to meet my husband and yeah, it's just, it's really sad that I'm unable to, to have that person in my life. Um, we both were pretty estranged from our parents from high school on. So we relied on each other. And so now it's like, 
I don't really have anyone. I mean, my little sister is now grown up too. So she's been, we've had more of a relationship now, but it's just not having that one family member that is really your only support system in your life. is just really hard. When it comes to my final thoughts about this case, I feel like the questions are endless. Did Joseph go see the blood moon? He likely did though, or probably tried to, since he had the binoculars around his neck. But here's the question, was he alone? And if not, who was there? And how did he end up in the water with over 60 pounds of rocks strapped to his chest? And if he wanted to kill himself, it would be a bizarre way to do it. And Vivian said that Joseph was an avid swimmer as well. Another thing is the strange note and the text that were almost identical and the idea of him leaving the country in those messages, and yet he never had a passport. As for his state of mind, Joseph's family says he was pretty stable and determined to make it in the world, so why cut things off when you're moving forward? And he had plans to meet up with some young women the week he vanished and seemed to be looking forward to it. And here's another thought. Was there something secretly happening in Joseph's life that no one was aware of and somehow someone else decided to end his life? Vivian also said that only one fraternity brother showed up at Joseph's memorial. The whole situation is strange, and honestly, it leaves you with more questions than answers. Now remember, investigators say it was determined to be a suicide, but the family is refusing to believe that, and they plan to have more investigation into Joseph's death. I'll keep an eye on the situation, and I'll bring you updates when I get them. If you have a case that you want me to check out, just visit me on the Intrigued Full Effect Facebook page or email me at intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. Until next time, be safe and stay true. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Intrigued Full Effect, Curious Cases, Disappearances, and Other Stuff podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the host. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The host of this podcast assumes no liability or responsibility for any activities in connection with opinions shared in the podcast. The podcast and blog associated with it shall not be used in any legal capacity or as a basis for expert testimony. Any copyright material in the podcast is approved by the owner or as part of the public domain. Music by Pond5.